great. Thank you guys for uh, joining our webinar today. Um, today we have uh, our guest, uh, Ash Hake, um, is joining us from Melbourne. Um, I'm Bertrand Young. I'm the Director of Business Development here at Curio. Uh, so I'm just going to start off with a very brief summary of Curio's products, and then I'll uh, hand it off to Ash. Again, you know, this is being recorded, and we'll have this up on our website uh, later on. And if you have any questions at all, you can uh, put them into the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Curio, we uh, are a very young company founded just a few years ago in February of 2021, uh, based in Northern California. And we have a lot of industry and academic leaders in the single cell and molecular accounting space who uh, founded our company, as well as many people uh, as, as employees. But really, our, our mission as a company is to advance a new generation of high precision tools for the spatial biology market, but also make these tools easily, easily accessible to all of you uh, to better help you um, accelerate your novel scientific discoveries. And we're doing that uh, with our core technology, which consists of a monolayer of 10 micron beads, each with its own unique spatial barcode. And uh, this uh, technology was actually originally based off of uh, something called SlideSeq V2 from the Broad Institute, uh, from Evan McCosco and Fei Chen's labs. Uh, but what this really enabled a lot of um, early and uh, more customers to do now is access uh, spatial transcriptomics um, very easily. And this doesn't require any instrument. It's just a kit that uh, you guys would purchase and generate libraries that you eventually sequence and process through our pipelines. And so this is our core technology, but we have actually two uh, different, very different types of kits uh, that are available based off of this. The first one being uh, Kiro Seeker. Uh, which is based off our foundational technology, SlideSeq. And just to briefly go over how this works, you would take a 10 micron section of fresh frozen tissue, put it onto one of our two tile sizes. We do have a three by three millimeter tile as well as a 10 by 10 millimeter tile. Um, directly put the tile into hybridization buffer and you'll put it into a tube or this little cartridge we have for the larger tile and you move it from two to tube or well-to-well -well from a hybridization buffer to RT mix, second strand synthesis. You'll take the beads off the tile, eventually uh, go through cDNA amplification, library prep, and then uh, sequence and put it through our pipeline. And once you put it through our pipeline, it will then map all of the transcripts uh, from your tissue back onto where it was spatially. So this whole thing is very quick, takes about eight hours of um, total time with about three hours of actual hands-on time. Now, the second platform that I'll just briefly go over is more recent, it's an early access. This is called Curio Trekker, and it's based off a technology called um, slide tags from the same two labs at the Broad Institute. And briefly, the way this works is kind of the opposite of the way you would expect from a lot of the spatial technologies these days, where normally, as I just mentioned, you take a section of tissue and you and mounted on the tile and you depend on diffusion of the RNA from the tissue onto the capture surface and depending where it gets captured, you can tell where it was originally based off the spatial barcode. But this technology is different and works in the opposite fashion where now we have a UV cleavable linker um, for these oligos on the beads. And uh, once you mount a 25 micron section of tissue on your beads, you expose it to UV light for about a minute it now releases the oligos from the beads. They now diffuse into the tissue, <laughs> excuse me. And they just uh, non-specifically bind to nuclei. And then what you do is you dissociate the tissue, isolate the nuclei, and you just run it through a standard um, single cell workflow, um, like 10X chromium, for example. Uh, and then once you do this, you get two uh, gene expression libraries. You'll get your normal gene expression library for your single nuclei. And then on top of that, layered on top of that, you'll have a, a, a FASTQ file or, or library for um, your trekker or spatial library. So the underlying gene expression data is exactly the same as what you would normally get, but you now have spatial information to go with it. 
So you just process the data uh, through um, the single cell pipeline to get a cell by gene matrix. You put that matrix through the curio pipeline and we just assign spatial barcodes to each one of those um, cells. Uh, so if you're interested in either one of these, you can contact us directly. Uh, they, they really uh, address different types of things. So CurioSeeker is the only solution for fresh frozen tissue at single cell scale resolution. It's a very simple instrument-free workflow, um, gives you a continuous whole transcriptome map. CurioTracker, on the other hand, converts any single cell experiment into a spatial one, uh, preserving the depth and sensitivity of single cell RNA sequencing. And uh, you know it's it's compatible with downstream uh, multi-ohm assays. So I'm going to end here, but uh, I'm going to now pass it off to Ash. Uh, we're thrilled to have him as a distinguished expert, and uh, you know he leads an immunology research team at the University of Melbourne, located in the uh, Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity. Immunity. The team's primary interest is to discover new ways to boost immunity to malaria, employing single-cell genomic and spatial transcriptomic methods to do so. So in today's session, uh, Dr. Hake will be presenting on his work using SliceSeq, the foundational technology of uh, CurioSeeker. So Ash, I'll hand it off to you. Thanks, Bertrand. Um, I might just try and... Uh share my presentation if you can just confirm that i'm doing things correctly sure. yep we can see it that's all there mm -hmm. wonderful um well thanks again for the opportunity to talk today um i'm based in melbourne at the university of melbourne uh, and at the doherty institute and here, here in australia uh, we acknowledge that um a couple of hundred years ago, uh, there was a period of European colonization that was not invited and it had negative consequences for the um, Aboriginal people that had been um, custodians of this land for tens, if tens of thousands of, of years. And so it's important for us in Australia to acknowledge that we are on the land of a, a specific uh, Aboriginal uh, nation. And here in Melbourne, I'm speaking from the lands of the Wurundjeri Waiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. And um, we conventionally and appropriately acknowledge the uh, elders of that nation, both past, present and emerging. And should there be anyone online uh, of Aboriginal, Australian Aboriginal descent joining us, I also pay my respects and welcome them. So having done that, I also want to acknowledge uh, my current team. And in particular, I'll use my, uh, I'll give a shout out to Cameron Williams, who has really um, helped us, dragged us into the spatial transcriptomic analysis field. And I'm going to spend most of the time talking about a recent study that was uh, motivated and run through the academic uh, precursor to Curio Seeker slide sheet version two, and I'll explain why we used it in a moment. Um, but I also want to say that here in the Institute, we are running Curio Seeker on a variety of different tissues, and I certainly know other groups who have uh, run um, mouse lymph nodes, for example, but our group is running mouse uh, liver samples and mouse. Um, lung, for example, and, and and human tissues as well. So happy to talk about that briefly at the end if anyone has any questions. But we, we were interested in the spleen and we we're interested in how T cells are generated in the spleen and, and, and what might control that process. So here is a conventional um, fluorescence microscopy image of a mouse spleen. And you can see, I hope, uh, areas of red and, and blue. Uh, these are uh, B cells, naive B cells in blue and T cell rich areas in, in red. And uh, you may also, if you look closely, see some green cells, which happen to be um, T cells, CD4 T cells that are specific for plasmodium, the, uh, the agent that causes malaria in humans. Now we're interested in those cells because 
they um, can be activated during an infection um, to form many different states like, and I'm not going to go through those names, except to say that in our chosen infection, we're interested in cells that develop into something called a T helper one cell um, and cells that develop into a T follicular helper cell. Now, these are, those are important because they can protect against blood stage uh, plasmodium infections it, it, via more than one likely mechanism. Of course, of prime importance uh, is the ability of TFH cells to persuade and assist B cells in making antibodies that are ultimately protective. So how do CD4 T cells um, differentiate into those forms? Well, a few years ago now, we were using a, uh, a an engineered T cell, uh, I, what we call the PBT2 cell developed in, in Melbourne by Bill Heath and his team. And using um, single cell RNA sequencing of, you know, of mashed up spleens, essentially disrupted tissues, we could essentially take um, a group of transcriptomes and reorder them to try and generate a model of how differentiation occurs. And that's what you're seeing on the right hand side with all these colors. Each dot is a transcriptome and each color denotes a time point. And the, the solid line indicates our inferred trajectory of differentiation towards TFH and TH1 phenotypes. And that was useful back then because we could generate databases that you, to this day, you can mine for your chosen gene of interest. Um, this is free if you're if you're interested, and I can we can show you how to get here. So you can look at any dynamics of any gene, and and I'm showing you CCR5 because that becomes important for the spatial work in a few moments. But of course, this has been generated with an engineered T cell, and so more recently over the last two years, we really wanted to know whether this split in fate occurs in malaria models uh, for endogenous real life T cells, if you like. And again, uh, using uh, single cell RNA sequencing of disrupted cells, we could, we could discover these two different fates in red and blue. And the lines that you see are joining uh, clones by virtue of the the uh, sequencing of their TCRs, which are unique. Um, but what the lines show you is that there is evidence of a single TCR uh, T cell giving rise to both of these fates by virtue of the crossing of these lines. So we're left with a model uh, originally suggested several years ago now in which a naive CD4 T cell uh, becomes activated it goes through a process that we call clonal expansion, and it seems to adopt one of two major fates. There are other rarer fates, but I won't be dwelling on those today. And we hypothesize based on data I haven't got time to go into today that, for example, um, monocytes um, support activated cells towards a Th1 phenotype and B cells, you know, su support and reinforce this TFH phenomenon, which is really well, a well-known phenomenon in the literature. So how does this process happen? And we have really stuck with um, sequencing messenger RNA. Uh, and we do that because it has a predictive quality. You know, we, we acknowledge that mRNA doesn't always lead to protein and function, but it's a useful tool for us to um, predict whether a given protein may be functionally relevant. And so what we really wanted to do was find out whether uh, what was associated with those T cells as they were differentiating. And that required um, spatial transcriptomics at near single cell resolution, which is why we turned to SlideSeq version two uh, originally and more recently CurioSeqer. Now, this is some quality control data of five of the original SlideSeq version two uh, arrays. Each violin plot is a different array. And you can see we have four from an uninfected uh, scenario and four from an inf uh, in magenta from an infected scenario. And you can see on the y-axis the number of genes that we could, unique genes that we could detect per 10 micron spot. 
and it's in the region of a few hundred to maybe a thousand if one is feeling if one's got a particularly good uh, area of the array. So with that data as it is, without any other supplementation, what can you do with it? Well, this is a representation of the data off uh, one of those arrays. Um, and each 10 micron bead is, is colored here by virtue of the a transcriptome and then an unsupervised clustering approach uh, um, find spots that have similar transcriptomes um, on them. And so to the immunologists in the audience, I, I hope I could convince you that uh, there's some structure there, but it's grainy and 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 not particularly um, you know well described. Now Cameron in our group used a process um, in, in inspired really by um, ST Learn, um, which we call local neighborhood neighborhood averaging, which really takes the transcriptome region fifty microns in radius around a given spot, averages that data, and then replots it. And re after reclustering, what you really get is a is a in a sense a um, oh let me go back. In a sense, is a is a micro anatomical vision of the of the spleen uh, using transcriptome data alone. Now that's useful, and you, one could imagine many scenarios in maybe a pathology lab where that sort of work could be extremely useful. Um, and there are certainly genes that we can detect that are of use to us for hypothesis testing or generation, but we acknowledge that that's not single cell um, because um, any single bead uh, will most likely, the most likely scenario is that two cells will can contribute uh, messenger RNA to that one bead. And of course, if you iterate that across the entire array, that's, that's a challenge. Um, but it's also an opportunity um, as highlighted in this next slide, because you can take single cell RNA sequencing data, either your own from the same experiment, or uh, as I'll show you in a minute, publicly available data from a separate data set. And you could use it to, um, if you like, deconvolute the data at every bead into uh, linear contributions of cells present in your reference. But you can also use the um, currently higher resolution, uh, higher uh, numbers of genes per cell, if you like, detected by single cell RNA sequencing to supplement the, the data uh, uh, available in the, in the spatial array. And so what you're left using in this algorithm, uh, robust cell type decomposition is uh, a contribution at each bead of every single cell in your reference. Now that's just one example of a deconvolution algorithm. Uh, we've also used uh, cell to location from the Sanger Institute and from the University of Cambridge or TACO, uh, another one which I'll talk about um, in, in a moment. And the upshot of that analysis is one can arrive at this sort of data. So along each axis is every cell type that we have defined from our single cell RNA sequencing reference. And in, in red, if cells are um, co-located consistently across the array, uh, it'll be more red. And if they're anti-correlated, uh, it'll be blue. And so what we see in this, uh, um, in this correlation plot for, um, for an infected spleen is actually merging of B cell zones and T cell zones in this area here, which are normally quite distinct in an uninfected spleen. And we could use this to test, um, actually I should show you what this looks like for the, for the infected spleen, sorry. Um, and so we can use this to test our original hypothesis, which is that CD4 T cells that had that were turning into Th1 cells were close to monocytes. Now, we, remember that was based off engineered T cells. And this is 
polyclonal endogenous CD4 T cells and monocytes. And lo and behold, in this area where I highlight down the bottom, Th1 cells, you can see that one of the red, most red spots, uh, red correlations, if you like, it is indeed with monocytes. And that's very different to how uh, the counterpart um, CD4 T cell type um, looks like, which is not correlated with monocytes. And, and if you want to see what that looks like um, on, a, on the actual data, I hope I can convince you in the upper um, image that red monocytes are co-localizing with polyclonal T helper one cells. And as a control below, you can see the polyclonal TFHs are nowhere near the monocytes and instead they're where we might hope them they would be, which is near um, B cells. So this was um, wonderful hypothesis testing for us. Um, but we wanted to go a little bit further because one of the approaches that we have to use when um, deconvoluting the data is to specify, if you like, an average transcriptome for the cell type of interest. But that doesn't really give us a full picture of um, the types of cells present, particularly when there are continuum when there are when there's a continuum of states. I'm trying to highlight that in the top U map here on the left, where on the left hand side we have Th1 cells, and the cells are colored according to how Th1 like they are. And, and while you can see some very purple Th1 cells, there are in fact other cells that are modestly uh, Th1 like. And so we wondered whether the one the cells that were most Th1 like had been supported most strongly towards that fate. Could they be more associated with monocytes than those cells that were modestly Th1? And so Cameron in our group used TACO to, if you like, throw the single cell data uh, onto the array and then, in a sense, categorize or binarize the Th1 cells as to whether they were close to um, a monocyte, which is depicted in um, this reddish color, or not close to a monocyte in gray. And of course, we have control TFHs on the right-hand side. Now, if you take those cells and then plot and examine their, how, how strongly Th1 they are, one, we noticed that those cells those Th1 cells that were closest to monocytes indeed had a higher Th1 score than those Th1 cells that were not proximal. So this again is consistent with this idea that proximity facilitated a supporting um, process of those Th1 cells towards that phenotype. Um, and what I like about that approach is that there's the potential to really look at nuanced and, and continuum of states in, in a spatially resolved manner. Well, of course, the data is rich. And so we wanted to mine the data, having shown that monocytes were close to Th1 cells, how could they be interacting? And again, in a freely available app you, and part of the manuscript, you can start to look at some of the inferred uh, molecular um, receptor ligand interactions between these cell types um, as assessed by, um, by, by an algorithm called cell chat. And um, what, we, what we noticed, for example, is that uh, one of the strongest interactions was between uh, was with a chemokine receptor CCR5. Now that's not something that we'd really thought about before. If if you look uh, at our app, at, for example, CCR5 in yellow, and and um, CCR4, its ligand in red, there, there's co-localization, and indeed they're in the areas where monocytes and Th1 cells are. So the spatial data allowed us to hypothesize a potential role for CCR5. And that permitted us to go back into the wet lab and start hypothesis testing. And so uh, Takahiro, a PhD student uh, in our group, 
took our engineered T cells and he um, knocked out uh, CCR5 using a CRISPR Cas9 uh, nuclear affection approach. And having done so and transferred those cells into mice and proceeded to infect them, he then examined those cells um, seven days after infection for evidence of, of, of any response. And, and first of all, in the left, on the left here, he, he confirmed by flow cytometry that in gray, uh, while, while there's upregulation of CCR5 in, in, in green, he was able to successfully knock out this receptor. And this had a surprising effect uh, on, on the numbers of these engineered cells that we could recover seven days later showing for the first time that this receptor may play a role in that clonal expansion um, um, process that's so critical for T cell immunity. But moreover, he found that there were qualitative changes in those, in those cells. And these flow plots on the right-hand side with a variety of markers, uh, it really just to summarize that, that cell markers associated with Th1, like CXCR6 and gamma and and CCR5, all were reduced in the absence of this receptor. And so this was, for us, a, a, um, an interesting finding that, that um, to summarize, took us from hypothesis generation using single cell RNA sequencing and uh, spatial transcriptomics through to um, in vivo functional testing of, of a, a potential in molecular interaction and we're now left uh, with this model that uh, T cells, as well as going through clonal expansion, that it's partially CCR5 dependent, also likely depends on monocytes to support the full differentiation of that process. And so I, I just want to stress that um, we felt that the spatial data was very, was very useful, not only for testing hypotheses, um, but also uh, you know, really ge generating new ones as well. So um, in the last phase uh, of this talk, I want to take a, a small tangential uh, um, slant and tell you about, well, really why we were, we were struck by how beautiful uh, this, um, uh, the spatial transcriptomic data was when we started to look at it. And, you know, one tends to think that that's a facile comment, you know, to be to to be interested in in the, the just the sheer beauty of the data. But there's more to it than that, in my opinion, because we started to realize that it had the potential to improve understanding of the cellular immune system, in particular in particular here, secondary lymphoid tissues. And so it's one of the only um you know, techniques that we know of where a single a single um, um, platform can discover tens uh, of different cell types and their relative locations. And so we, we, we struck up a working relationship with a company here in Melbourne. It's a global company who has who has expertise in um, in CGI uh, and, um, you know, com uh, computer generated graphics for, for games and, and, and films. And we said, could you convert this into uh, as our tr tr spatial transcriptomic data, firstly, into something that looks like a real spleen, uh, which is what you're seeing now, but, but also so that if we take the data and, and, and really zoom in to the data, we should see a, a visual representation that is, is, is like the, like, you know, like a, where you can see real cells, I guess is what I'm saying. And so uh, DET uh, converted the spatial transcriptomic data uh, into something that looks like real cells. You can see B cells in blue and orange and yellow T cells. And, um, you know, for, for those of you who are, who are not interested in T cells or B cells, I, I, I find that hard to believe, but you can look at fibroblasts uh, in spidery um, detail here. You can look at monocytes in red. Or you can look at the the dendritic searching functions of these uh, of these of DCs. Now, this of course is an artistic's rendition, 
but the position is not artistic. These are based on the spatial transcriptomic data. And so it, it, is, it is compelling, we have found, to share this with a number of different people. And, and, and just as an example, um, we, we ran these, these apps uh, for in, um, in, um, in front of secondary school students aged, you know, 15, 16. Uh, and and I, th I believe we, it helped them understand uh, the way their, their own immune organs are structured and how, you know, taking a vaccine might encourage those B cells to start dancing with those T cells. And, and that, you know, in an era where it's really important to, um, to convey concisely and honestly uh, our research to our general public, I think that's a powerful, uh, a powerful uh, tool. And we hope to continue that in our undergraduate teaching and, and in our efforts to convey to the general public why immune systems are important for healthy living. So the last slide I want to share with you is really a work in progress where we 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 haven't really made huge amount of headway yet, but that's to can go from two dimensional uh, arrays, which have been very useful as I've highlighted through to generating well, what we want to do, which is 3D volumes that are, you know, immersive. And here we have uh, four curio seeker slices of a, of a naive spleen. And um, they have been taken 40 microns uh, apart from each other from the same spleen. And uh, we are trying to um, um, stitch them back together, if you like, using a variety of different algorithms at, at the moment. And, and what you're seeing is simply a local neighborhood averaging um, uh, coloration of these slides. But what you're hoping to do over the next few months is to, is to genuinely is stitch them together, make a 3D volume, and then turn it into a into a mineable database uh, for, for researchers. So that's very much a work in progress, but I did want to give you a flavor of where, where the group is, is trying to go currently. Uh, and I'm very happy to talk about the challenges associated with that process. So I just want to take a few moments to, uh, to acknowledge a, a few people. Look, first of all, I'll uh, need to acknowledge um, the University of Melbourne, which houses uh, my team and I, and the Doherty Institute, uh, which is a joint venture with the University and the Royal M Melbourne Hospital. And uh, I urge you to come and visit us if you're in in the uh, in Melbourne. Um, I also want to acknowledge the um, the financial support of the Australian National Health and Medical Research Council, which funds us um, through the Ideas Grant Scheme. Um, I really want to bestow uh, my, my great thanks to Fei Chen and the Broad Institute who 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 uh, responded to our request for collaboration um, a few years ago, and and it's been a very fruitful collaboration. Um, and look, it's been it's been great to get uh, Curio Biosciences over uh, to Australia and Chameleon. Uh, science is the distributor here, and um, and so we really do owe uh, um, a debt of thanks to Chameleon for um, facilitating our ongoing research here in Melbourne and Australia using this technology. So I will think I'll um, stop there, if that's okay, Bertrand, and if you've got any questions, I'll be delighted to answer them. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, just a reminder to everybody, if you do have any questions, please uh, type them into the Q&A box uh, below. Um, but yeah, thanks, Ash, for that amazing talk. I really enjoyed how you're trying to uh, reach a broader audience, especially the younger generation. I think that's really important to um, show them how cool spatial actually is. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start off maybe with a small question. So it, has this interaction of CCR5 been previously looked into or discovered, or is it just now because you're looking at spatial that you've seen this um, type of thing? So there, there have been previous publications using um, cell lines, human cell lines like Jerkats, for example, to show that in those cell lines, CCR5 can 
um, become concentrated at the immunological synapse between a CD4 T cell and an antigen presenting cell type of some description. So there's that suggestion that there might be a, a role for CTR5 in T cell activation or reactivation. Again, that's a cell line. Um, there's also um, a JI paper using primary human uh, T cells from, from an individual who has a germline mutation in CTR5, suggesting again that there might be a role for CTR5 in reactivation of human CD4s. Um, but we would say that there's um, that that's those are the only two bits of, of data that I can we can readily find. And so we think that probably is the first data showing that CCR5 could have a role in that clonal expansion process and, and certainly in vivo data on roles in controlling um, effector differentiation. So yes, I'd say that's novel. Okay. Got it. I can see a question uh, in the um, yes. Q&A from uh, mm -hmm. Anjana. Sure. Um, and let me just uh, state it right. again. Uh, did you correlate spatial transcriptomic images with actual histo images? That's a great question. We didn't do so. Um, it originally, we 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 just took a took a bet and took a slice, and we we now do take um, the subsequent slice for some sort of microscopy, whether it be uh, immunohisto or uh, an, an H and E stain. Um, but it's a great point. We we are we do that now, but we we didn't back then. Yeah, and at least from Curio's side, uh, we do actually suggest if you do need a histopathology slide or image on top of the data, you can get that with the serial section. Uh, we do have some guidance on how to overlay those images pretty well with current AI techniques that will adjust the um, features a little bit to to fit more nicely. Um, so there's it's been, you know, quite successful, and um, you know the the methods have been improving over time. So I think you can probably use that if you need to. All right. Um, any other experiences looking into other tissues on in your hands, Ash? Yes. So we we um, despite the fact that my group focuses on malaria, we uh, we 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 have had we do have a project looking at influenza infection um, and so that prompted us to go into the lung and uh, so we've been using curio seeker for that uh, we've got our sequencing data back so i can't share any insights with you um, we certainly did we were certainly worried about wasting our money <laughs> if you like doing the lung because there's so much airspace we thought oh my gosh you know we're we going to we're going to, uh, most of the array is going to be blank space um and, and so we we thought maybe we would squash the lung down a bit of course that would that would have been ridiculous and we had to um partially inflate lungs with with a um with oct 50 percent oct to, to to kind of retain a structure that would be meaningful um but that again that that tissue was um was relatively uh easy for us to 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 section and and get onto curioseca so that was that was good um the the other tissue was that we I can comment on is the liver and again that was quite homogeneous it was from an infection scenario but there wasn't heavy you know build up of collagen or granulomas or anything like that but nevertheless that that was um that data again is mid analysis but it all looks interpretable and um we are using we're using that in the same sort of using the same sort of pipelines of deconvoluting and, and testing for co-localization of cell types so that's the other tissue um i we 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 have designs on um running some human tissues but i haven't got any data all i will say is that our cryo sectioning uh, of that tissue looks great and we, we're in the just in the next few weeks going probably going to run a curio seeker on that so i hope that's of some help thank you for that helps um there is a question from anjana again 
Uh, thank you for answering the question, Ash. Great work. We are working with high risk pathogens, and is there a point in the Curio pipeline where these viruses uh, might be able to be inactivated? Oh, I, I, I'm not sure about that uh, because the fixation doesn't yeah. happen till uh, later. Um, so I think I'll pass on to Bertrand. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, currently, uh, both our platforms, Seeker and Trekker, are only available for fresh frozen. Um, however, for Trekker, what you know, we were, or I was presenting earlier in the talk um, that uh, Ash has not yet run as currently, again, uh, only for fresh frozen, but we're uh, going to be aiming for release for FFPE tissue later this year. So I would say uh, for Trekker, that would be more likely to happen than not, as opposed to Seeker. Um, so if you're interested in that, just um, let us know, or you can contact uh, Chameleon Science, and uh, they can set up a meeting with us. All right. Um, I guess one more general question. You know, are there any caveats that people should look out for and in, in this type of data or working with other uh, types of things here? So um, but like I the first one was mentioned earlier, which is you, we, we you can't we have we you can't get a um, uh, a light microscopy image of the actual slice that you're using. So the the workarounds as you just alluded to version, which is you know take the next slice and 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 use uh, uh, other approaches to 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 map onto. Uh, I think that's that's an important caveat. Uh, I think the second one again was alluded to, which is that you know it, 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 the fresh frozen um, tissue requirement uh, might not be appropriate for for everyone, and we. We are unsure, for example, whether if there if there are tissues that have lots of RNAs, um, whether they might you might get degradation of your messenger RNA before you've really had a chance to to get to you know cDNA conversion and and sequencing. So that might be appropriate to do some analysis of RNA integrity uh, on tissues and your tissue samples prior to prior to running it. Uh, I think that's probably. That's something that we're starting to do, but again, we haven't got our head around what tissues are are, are susceptible to RNA degradation more so than others. Um, that's a caveat, and um, I think the obvious the obvious one is that um, although although I'm sure you're doing a lot for for pricing, it's still a stressful day um, <laughs> when you're when you're slicing and you've got to you've got to try and relax and. Um, you know, have some trial runs on some dummy slides. That's really, really super important. And and Curio, uh, I think you you certainly helped us with that. Um, but just practice, practice, practice before you get onto it. And I think I even have one one member of our team decided to do their sectioning on a weekend because the lab is often busy and they just wanted no one else around while they're doing it. So anything you need to do to kind of keep your stress levels down re is really important. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I mean, I guess for any assay, you really want to do that. Especially, <laughs> yeah, we have we have practice tiles now for everybody, so hopefully that will help um, into the future. And interesting, you mentioned um, uh, tissues that may have higher amounts of RNAs. We've had some customers uh, run this on like pancreatic tissue, which is notorious for RNAs, and it still works pretty well. So we're hopeful that over time, people find ways to get this more robust for those tissue types. But um, yeah, uh, I guess, are there any other questions? If there aren't, I'm going to um, end this webinar early. Um, but again, you know, thank you, Ash, for giving this talk. It's a pleasure having you here with us today. And, no, no problem. Uh, um, and if anyone wants to reach out via email um, for any other questions, I'll, I'll be happy to uh, interact. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you again, everybody, for joining, and uh, we'll see you all next time.